Welcome back to our Economics of Regulation course. Uh, we are in the midst of the discussion of regulation under moral hazard. And I think pretty much what we ended with was this slide uh, on in, in last week. Uh, the starting point of all this discussion uh, is that the cost of a firm depends stochastically on the effort uh, of, of the firm and of its managers. Uh, as a consequence, the regulator, even though she can observe whether the firm has high costs, doesn't know whether the costs are high or low, or whether the costs are high, for instance, uh, because the firm didn't work hard or because there was uh, an adverse environmental shock. Okay, that's our starting point, and what we need to find out is the optimal regulatory mechanism or the optimal contracts, so to say, Uh, if we want uh, or if we want to tackle with this problem of asymmetric information, with this private information a firm has, as only the firm knows how much it or how hard it worked and how much effort it put into. The regulator uh, is assumed again to maximize expected consumer surplus. And uh, what I already told you last uh, week is that here we can or we have to put uh, the firm's objective not in terms of its rent, but in terms of its utility. Uh, I uh, explained to you that rent and uh, this uh, uh, utility are different from each other at least uh, as soon as we allow for uh, different risk, uh, risk attitudes or for something like risk aversion. And uh, our starting point is, and that's what we have here, the regulator maximizes the expected uh, consumer surplus, and consumer surplus, and I derived that uh, in the last lecture, depends on the utility of the firm, and we just can put uh, the utility of the firm, excuse me, the, the rent of the firm in terms of the utility. So the point is that we can uh, to, uh, put the, and I think I just switch over to one note here so that you you see that Uh, here uh, is the example I used so that we saw how we can put, actually it was in this previous part here, uh, where we uh, derived the rent of the firm here. Uh, it's just simply pi plus t, but we know that uh, the utility is here in this simple example just the square root of the rent, wherefore we can, uh, or we immediately know what the utility is that uh, 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 R is equal to U squared, and that's how we obtain this relation between consumer surplus and uh, utility, where we previously just had the re uh, relation between uh, consumer surplus via the tax payments or the transfer payments and the rent. We now have this relation with the utility. Okay, so that that should be clear. And of course, the regulator has to take into account the co the, uh, the standard constraint. This constraint here is nothing else than the incentive compatibility constraint, which uh, derives from the first order condition of the of the firm in terms of what effort it should choose, and that effort depends on this. Uh, in a sense, on this power of the incentive scheme, that is, what is the gain in utility if you get uh, if you get the good state rather than the bad, and then we can put that directly as the optimal function here, the phi. And and remember that the firm in our setup just chose the phi, the probability that you get the good state. The harder you work, that's a simple or the the the, the, the assumption. The harder you work, the higher is the probability that you end up in the good state. Okay, and the, the assumption here is that the more, the higher your utility gain typically is, the harder you would work. And of course, we also have the, the participation constraint, and we will get back uh, to that uh, in a second. Uh, and what we also played around with was already that we can reformulate that by using the, the participation constraint, just meaning that the expected utility is nothing else than the outside utility. That is, we add just zero here uh, if it binds. And therefore, we can put all that in terms of total surplus rather than just in terms of consumer surplus. And that uh, was written here. So the welfare is just uh, the expected 
uh, total surplus, of course, we then have to take into account this, this utility from providing effort. And yeah, here we just define uh, total surplus as consumer surplus or plus plus uh, firm's utility. So, and I think this was actually the last uh, slide I did with you on last uh, Thursday without, however, discussing that in detail, and that's what I want to do now. So we first look into the full information outcome. What does it mean? Yeah, the firm, uh, the regulator can really observe how hard the firm worked. And if it can do that, it can, of course, just say, OK, you work uh, so that you, we get, obtain this, uh, this file here. And therefore, the regulator directly controls the effort, has to choose then in, in, in her maximization problem effort and the utilities. And of course, always have to observe the, the participation constraint. And so this is just what we just uh, derived. Okay. We maximized uh, total welfare, and total welfare is just expected welfare minus the utility from work. And we put that now in terms of a Lagrangian because we have to satisfy that the participation constraint is satisfied. And here the participation constraint is in some, some detail here. It's just the, the expected utility. Remember, we had this discussion of the Neumann von Morgenstern utility function von Neumann Morgenstern utility function, of course. And uh, yeah, that, that's what we had as a, as a participation constraint. Here, the point is compared to the adverse selection model. Here, we have a single firm, not two types, a single type. And uh, we control, first of all, the incentive. Uh, and, and here, we don't get any rent, uh, or we, we control the effort. Uh, by observing incentive compatibility constraint, and at the same time, we have to satisfy the, the participation constraint. In particular, in the case where we consider uh, where we consider uh, risk, neutral, risk neutral firm, you will see that this works perfectly together. We can at the same time offer incentives and uh, observe the participation constraint. Okay, so uh, the first part here is simply is simply uh, the, the expected welfare, uh, and the second part here is just a constraint. And here, uh, further on, we will. We, this is just for completeness that we use this outside opportunity U0, U0 uh, without any uh, restriction of generality. We will set that equal to to zero in, in the following part, just uh, to have it once here. And uh, the the second line here. Uh, is uh, the standard kind of rearrangement uh, 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 Armstrong Sepping always do here. They first of all they introduce, they add the U uh, to the V in order to get the W, the welfare, and here we do it, uh, we, we, we uh, sub subtract it again and put that on the other side so that you get uh, just uh, one, uh, an additional one here. Remember, we just got uh, this, this expression by adding. Uh, the participation constraint, and now we uh, put that, just rearrange it and put it here. Okay. Uh, the, the point is uh, that now it looks really very much like in the Ramsey uh, problem, and uh, the advantage is, uh, as you will see, we uh, can put the first order condition very nicely. Okay. So, uh, of course, once we've done, once we know what our uh, variables to optimize are, and what our optimization problem looks like, we are happy because we just can apply our uh, st uh, standard uh, differentiation and we just obtain a first order condition. And that's what we are going to derive right now. So we have our three variables, phi, ul, and uh, and here just the derivative with respect to uh, it's my lines here. The derivative uh, with respect to UL uh, is, is straightforward. Uh, here, UL enters here and it enters here. Okay, so very straightforward. Phi uh, times V prime UL plus one plus lambda phi. And uh, analogously, we get the derivative for the high uh, cost uh, utility UH if uh, high cost. Uh, or the outcome, uh, and this looks completely analogous. And, and finally, we we uh, get the derivative with respect to phi. You see here again, erasing that the phi shows up here, 
shows up here. And so we get uh, the difference in terms of consumer surplus. Uh, and, and of course, it shows up also in the, in the, in the constraint uh, as we see here. And now uh, we, so this is now a very general approach. We will see further examples in a, in a minute. But what the nice thing is, and what economists always try to do, is they try to uh, de de derive results as general as possible. And that's what we are going to do, what you see here. Here you easily can just uh, uh, cancel out the phi, as you can cancel out the, the 1 minus phi in the next first order condition. And what you see is that V prime will be equal uh, to minus 1 plus lambda and V prime, v prime L, UL uh, will be equal to minus 1 plus lambda. And the same holds for V prime H. Okay, and that's what's written on the next page. And uh, that's what I just showed you. And both things are the same. And that means, in a sense, uh, yeah, what is it? This is uh, the marginal rate of substitution or the marginal utility, in a sense. And the marginal utility uh, of the firm uh, will have to be uh, the, the same. So, uh, again, I might just jump here again to our case or to our, to our example we had here. Uh, if you see, uh, if you take uh, just the derivative here, i just go here because that's today. If you take the derivative uh, here of uh, vi uh, prime ui, okay, that's, that's the vi. If you take the derivative, you just get minus two, here you should have it, ui, okay? And so uh, uh, that's what you see, and this is uh, this is simply our result here. Uh, in the if if this, this, in our example, this would in both cases be just minus two u l equal minus two u h, and that therefore we immediately get u uh, l is equal to u h. And what we had here in our previous example was that v of u is concave, that's exactly what I showed you, uh, due to the concavity of UT, two, uh, UT because uh, the firm is uh, risk averse. Okay? U of T is, of course, U of the uh, transfer here. Okay? Uh, just a von Neumann Morgenstern function. So, important result, first order condition, these derivatives. Uh, or which just have nothing else than the marginal utility of the firm in it, uh, they just uh, are, are identical, okay? And as a result, we get that utility of the firm is the same in both states. Irrespective of whether we have high or low cost as an outcome, the firm bears no risk. The firm being, uh, being uh, risk averse here in this uh, example, gets complete insurance. Okay, that's the first important result. If you have, and that's what we assumed here, I don't know whether I mentioned it before, if you have, in a sense, a, a principal who is, who is uh, risk neutral, and we assume here that the regulator, and therefore also uh, pretty much the, the consumers, are risk neutral, uh, they will insure the risk adverse. Agent. Okay, here it's the consumers because yeah, in Germany there are 80 million taxpayers, so you would hardly notice or uh, notice if there is a small change with respect to to some transfer somewhere. Okay, for for to some to, to some uh, industry. Okay, yeah, that was the first important part, and the second important part is our second condition we get here. Uh, and here in this condition we had it on a previous page. The only thing is that we had uh, the 1 plus lambda there in this condition, and we just substitute here for the 1 plus lambda uh, from, from the other first order condition, and we get here the other important result which determines in the sense how high we should set our phi. And here on the left hand side, you have the gain from increase in phi. This is somehow the marginal pro productivity of effort. Notice that uh, here, if you, if you have uh, the low state, you have low cost, and therefore you will have a, uh, 
a low price and therefore high consumer surplus. And of course, this is again compared to the state in which you have a high uh, a cost and therefore a high price and a low consumer standard. And so this is a gain from an increase in phi because that becomes now more likely. If you have a marginal increase uh, in phi, it becomes more likely that you get this gain. And on the other side, you have to trade that off uh, with the higher effort you need. Uh, and this is just a derivative of this, this utility function. And in a sense, uh, this is in a slightly compensated because it gets a slightly higher chance now also the firm that it gets the higher utility UL compared to UH. However, uh, as we previously saw here, and that's the last bullet point, here in our case, uh, if we fully insure the firm, uh, there is a delta U, which is actually UL minus UH, will simply be zero. So this effect just cancels out in, in the optimum. And uh, finally, this V prime UL, uh, here this is in utility terms, and we have to translate that back again. Uh, into, say, monetary terms. Uh, as you know, even though utility is also just a real number, uh, in our previous case, if the rent was 100 and we had uh, utilities just the square root of the rent, the, the utility would have been uh, just 10. And here we just uh, invert that again, in a sense. Okay, yeah, th that's our results. And what we are doing right now uh, is, first of all, looking into the second best so that this becomes clear. And then I will provide you some specific examples and I hope that it gets clearer that, or it gets uh, really clear after we have done that. Okay? Yeah, th th that's uh, what we have done. So we will play around with these conditions and then uh, they should become uh, clearer. Apart from that, we will of course always also have a problem in the assignment here. So, and the nice or the interesting thing is now we have adverse, uh, uh, or excuse me, adver, uh, uh, asymmetric uh, information. So the regulator can only control the phi via, uh, via the power of what we call the incentive scheme. That is the difference between, uh, this is simply UL minus UH. That's what I uh, defined on the previous on the previous slide, okay? And we know if we make this difference larger, the firm will work larger because in a sense it has more to lose. And uh, here we implicitly define then phi just simply as uh, a function of this power of the incentive scheme. And uh, now this is what we derived uh, just on the previous slide, okay? Or actually it was two slides ago. Our Lagrangian, our uh, optimization function for for the regulator, and it's exactly the same, apart from the fact that now uh, we take into account as a, uh, uh, as a regulator that we control phi only via, via delta u, that is uh, via the difference between ul and uh. Okay, but that, that's what it is. Apart from that, it, it's straightforward. Again, uh, we add here the, the a participation constraint, and it's in this uh, specific kind of Ramsey uh, formulation, in a sense. Okay, and now, and that's a nice thing. Once we know, once we know the the, the optimization function, the Lagrangian, uh, it's straightforward to derive our results. And therefore, of course, the the real problem will then be to make sense to interpret these conditions. So that's always what you always should do once you. Uh, discuss some, some paper. The important point is not only the, the equations and the formulas, but the important point is what do they mean? Okay. Again, here uh, we, we maximize expected consumer surplus. That should be clear with the probabilities. And then here we take the first order conditions. Now, they look much more ugly than previously. Uh, here, uh, if we the, if we take the derivative of the first uh, 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 term here, we have to apply product rules. So we just take the derivative with respect to the first argument times the second. And here, the, the, the derivative with respect to the second argument times the third. And remember that delta u is simply ul minus uh. So the derivative here uh, of, of uh, delta u uh, with respect to ul is simply one here. And so we get therefore uh, V prime L. Uh, yeah. So that's what we get here. Okay. 
straightforward. And of course, the same thing for the high type here, only the, the, the delta, uh, the phi, excuse me, the phi depends on delta and uh, similar for the, for the, for the uh, participation constraint. Is also no, no problem, hopefully. So here, everything uh, should be clear right now. The not, not so nice thing is that uh, it really looks ugly. And if you look at it at the first time, uh, you will really have trouble to understand uh, anything, even though the, the first line here should should be clear okay now the second line is is rather interesting because what you see here you see here phi, uh, phi prime times uh, ul you have here phi prime you have here phi prime okay and uh, if you just uh, factor these together these terms you will see it's phi prime times ul minus here's a minus minus uh minus d prime okay but that's nothing else than our first order condition. I don't know where I, I should jump back, uh, but that was our our first order condition. I just look up where where we had this first order condition. I think we I think we had it on 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 this. Uh, here was the first order condition. And here you see d, d prime is nothing else than ul minus uh, uh as the equilibrium effort. But that means simply that the terms I just uh, showed you, uh, they are zero. Okay, they cancel out. And so this was this term, this term, and this term. Uh, they are just zero times, uh, times phi prime. So that cancels out and we get a much nicer nicer uh, uh, condition oh i wouldn't have to have jumped back because i had written it anyway here uh, and but you get here in terms of what you get out as a derivative of the of the participation constraint is only uh, what we would call the direct effect okay times phi okay yeah but now already and that's uh, you here you see why it's nice to put it in these terms uh, of, of this Lagrangian approach with this 1 plus lambda. Again, you see what we can do is here you have the phi v prime of ul. And if you remember what we did in a full information case, we had that this phi times v prime l is equal to minus 1 plus lambda phi. Okay? That was our first order condition uh, in, in this case. And now we just put all these other stuff here on the other side. Uh, and I think that's what hopefully I do on the next page. Uh, here we have the uh, v l prime u l, okay. And in the in the full information outcome, we simply had this this uh, point and uh, or, or this uh, term, and it was the same for v l and and u l, okay. And now you see now it's different because there is some additional term here. And this additional term here, just as a shorthand, remember, uh, we, we just used the delta V is, is nothing else than the, the, the gain, in a sense, in, in consumer surplus from the good state, from the low cost to the high cost. Okay. And you see, uh, phi prime, the derivative of the, of the, of the disutility or, or the optimization function here, uh, is, is, is positive. And that is, uh, phi just increases if you have a high, that's our basic assumption, okay? You work harder if you get more in a state compared to the other state, okay? The, you provide incentive, therefore uh, you have a minus here, so which is lower than. And uh, similarly, uh, of course, you have to take uh, the derivative with respect or to, to uh, take the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to UH and you get this, and here you have something positive. Okay, so as a result, uh, from the VUL, uh, from the VL prime, you, you subtract something. So VL prime gets smaller uh, to VH compared to the full information outcome. VH prime, you add something, so it gets larger. And therefore, as a result, you have, uh, you have uh, that the here that the VL prime is smaller than the VH prime. 
Okay, but that immediately means if VU is concave, and that's what we just assumed, that is, if our firm is risk averse, UL will be smaller than uh, UH. Okay, uh, and again, I think I always have to jump back to my to my uh, diagram here. Uh, that that's what you saw here. Uh, here we just looked into the derivative, and of course, the derivatives of this uh, concave function are smaller once we get farther out here. Okay, uh, that's actually what we have. Hopefully uh, that, that, that's clear. That, that's due to this uh, concavity. So UL will be larger, the derivative will be uh, smaller, therefore UL will be larger if uh, V prime is smaller. Okay, Th that, that's, that's what we have. Yeah, and the point is now no more complete insurance. The firm bears, bears risk. We have a different utility and, of course, a higher utility if the, the good state, that is the low cost turnout, than in the bad state in which the high, uh, high uh, cost turnout. And therefore, we provide the firm uh, with some incentives because, of course, uh, if UL were equal to UH uh, and the incentive compatibility constraint has to be observed, then the firm would just, by assumption, not exert any effort. Okay, that, that's our important result, and that's a very general, hopefully, nevertheless, it's clear. Uh, in the notes I gave you, uh, just for the example I had in, in, in one note, I, uh, I calculated this, and there you see it immediately that you have this difference. And what I uh, do in the next slides now, and in the, in the remaining, say, 10, 15 minutes of, of this chapter, is I just give you uh, some specific examples for a utility function in, part, in particular for, for uh, risk attitudes and what then the relation is between this uh, utility of the firm and the consumer surplus. Perhaps I make a short break here and ask for questions. Okay, we move on. So hopefully uh, the next examples make this then uh, more cl or clearer and more illustrative here. So the first thing we start with is in a sense the easiest case because you don't have a problem in terms of insurance. We assume that the firm is risk neutral and of course we always assume here in this chapter that we can pay uh, transfers. And then it's very straightforward, as in all of the previous case, uh, the firm can either be in state L or H, and of course we get a, a respective uh, profit then as a function of, of the price. Of course, the point here is now the firm or the regulator knows in which state we are, okay, and can determine the price. V of uh, P is again the consumer surplus, and uh, a small W is simply the total surplus, and what we know here is that a regulator sets some price which maximizes uh, the total surplus and of course that price will, be, will then be the efficient one price equal marginal cost. And uh, of course some further notation, if the regulator sets a price P and gives a transfer T, the rent is just R is pi plus T. I just dropped here the, the subscripts, subscripts, it should be clear. And now the important point is here that uh, remember, it was just a straight line, the relation between uh, monetary income and utility in terms of, of risk neutrality. So we can simply set that U is equal to R. And so the setup is pretty much the same as we always had. And uh, now here you again see very directly uh, this relation between uh, or why we can put this uh, total or this, this consumer surplus, this more general consumer surplus, taking into account the transfer has here, so the, the net consumer surplus from that market minus the transfer. And if we substitute from up here uh, that the transfer is simply R minus minus pi, uh, and that we and we also substitute that or uh, that that R is equal to U. What we get here is that our uh, large V here, our consumer surplus, is just a function or related to the U of the firm, the utility of the firm. 
as it was just with the transfer and the transfer directly relates to you and here uh, in, a, in a case of risk neutrality it's even a linear function and so what we get here is yeah, here's nothing else than our total surplus and so we, we, we can put here our v of u that's what we previously had in terms of of total surplus minus u and uh, what we uh, define here is just a definition as the notation is that uh, large w uh, as a function of u is here just uh, v prime remember i don't know do, did i write it here no i didn't uh, remember that uh, w was just defined as v plus u probably you won't be able to distinguish my u from the v but uh, that's what it's meant to be okay and that's not a greater but it's an equality sign uh, and that's why uh, if you put this u on the other side uh, that's what we get here okay so and now uh, we, we just uh, substitute the previous uh, or apply the previous first order condition remember we calculated this here uh, remember in the full information outcome uh, we, we had the, the same uh, the the same uh, utility in both cases uh, and what we will look into whether we can not have the same utility in both cases but whether we can implement uh, the solution uh, of of the full information ca uh, case in terms of the phi so that we get the first best uh, the full information phi in this case the full information effort and so our first order condition remember that's what we derived hopefully you remember was just this condition so this is the gain in consumer surplus and this has to trade off the the increase in effort here. okay and now uh, with with uh, risk neutrality this is straightforward because uh, that's uh, what i just showed you uh, the derivative is simply minus one so we can substitute up here and uh, so we get and substitute the previous things here uh, we, we derived and what we get here uh, on a previous slide is, is this condition and you see immediately that this UL minus UH uh, 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 cancels out and what we get is that this is nothing else and I think I have uh, written it down here anyway uh, this uh, right hand side is nothing else than the marginal productivity of effort that's what I already uh, interpreted or, or told you before so you see what is the increase in total surplus uh, if we move from a state with high cost to a state with low cost okay and uh, that, that's simply uh, the different triangles we have in terms of our, the different consumer surplus triangles in terms of our illustrations of our uh, diagrams we, we had before okay and on the right uh, on the, excuse me on the left hand side you have the marginal cost of effort what does it cost uh, in terms of uh, the firms or the firms managers this utility if they have to increase the phi that is they have to increase the effort and okay that's what we have here and uh, here the full information outcome uh, if the firm is risk neutral risk sharing is not important it doesn't matter who uh, who bears the risk uh, as long as in a sense uh, the expected utility is the same uh, the firm doesn't care for whether ul is equal to uh or ul is much higher than uh okay as, as long as the expected uh, value is the same so and therefore uh, Risk allocation is typically also not determined uniquely, uh, and all allocations satisfying the, po the, 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 the participation constraint are solutions. So if phi would be one half, uh, and suppose this utility would be zero, of course it wouldn't matter whether you have uh, 10, a payment of 10 in a good state and a payment of minus 10 in a bad state, or whether a payment of 100 in a good state or a payment of minus 100 in a good state in both cases the expected value would be zero okay uh, now what we are and that's what i already uh, told you previously soon we want to look whether we can implement this solution the the full information outcome solution under asymmetric information and whether we of course that uh, whether we are able to satisfy the incentive compatibility constraint and uh, so th that's what you, I will show you on the reminder and in particular how that works in detail 
uh, on the on the next slide. But here the point is you have the delta u, which is nothing else than this increase in total surplus. The firm should choose a uh, phi prime. Uh, what what uh, you will see here that actually the firm gets the full difference in uh, this, this gain here. Uh, that's from our previous case we just had from our first order condition. That is that that uh, uh, the, the VL minus PL. Yeah, this is just the definition we used here. Okay, and uh, if we want to have the, the first order condition satisfied, th that's what what we I think we, we showed here. Okay. The, the, the optimal condition in or the, the optimal uh, the optimal full information outcome is that you have determined uh, the the phi by this condition okay and in order of course to get the respective uh, to get the respective solution uh, in 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 a situation of asymmetric information you just have to pay or to give uh, the, the the regulated firm an incentive like this. So the delta u has to be equal to to this expression, and that's what I just uh, stated stated here. Okay. So the delta u has to be equal to 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 this expression because then uh, from this it follows that firm chooses uh, phi star. Okay. That's the important point. And now. <laughs> so I have written that anyway here. Okay, firm chooses five star. That's from our first order condition, and uh, from the previous condition, which just read that V L minus V H is equal to W uh, L minus W H minus delta U. Uh, if you assume this, of course, this is zero, and so the consumers will have the same surplus in the, the highest high cost stage than in the low cost stage. Okay? The firm bears, bears all risk and obtains the same the total gain in the case uh, in which we get the good state. And therefore the full information outcome is feasible. Okay? Uh, that's then once again just uh, rearranged in the same way uh, we had it uh, here. Uh, so implementing this full information outcome pretty much what we did here uh, is, is what we, we just wrote, what we just derived. The point is here, and I don't want to go back because it would only confuse you, we already derived it. Uh, so what, what we know is that we have to set uh, this, this delta u equal to this uh, wl minus wh. Okay, that's what we have because then we get the, the right uh, kind of, of incentive. And the point is, of course, what we know is that the difference in utility has to be UL minus UH has to be equal to this WL minus WH. Uh, but at the same uh, uh, time is we know here that we get the right incentive, but at the same time we want to satisfy uh, the participation constraint and don't want to pay to pay any 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 rent, and that means uh, so if if this this uh, delta u would be 100, uh, and and we don't want to pay something, uh, uh, we we want to don't want to pay any 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 uh, rent. We just uh, have here. You see that's what in a different case your payment is. You get a transfer. Uh, in, in a good state of, I don't know what consumer surplus is, 1,000 in a good state and 500 in a bad state. And of course, you, you get this difference here, but the point is that you have to pay, uh, in a sense, uh, a tax, okay, minus K. And K is chosen in a way that our participation constraint uh, is, is zero or is equal to U uh, zero, and uh, we have zero rents. Okay, and uh, that that should become much clearer in in or should really become clear in the problem we have in the assignment. Actually, I perhaps I just if I'm able to to find it, I just uh, point to that. So so what we do here is uh, show how we can implement such a solution here in, in this example uh, under asymmetric information for a risk-neutral firm. 
Okay, and that's uh, where we have to calculate that. Okay, you will see uh, that this is uh, then uh, actually rather straightforward. Okay, and the point is here actually what we are doing is we make the firm the residual claimant on social surplus. Okay, uh, we just say you uh, get everything, you get this increase. Uh, you get this increase uh, in terms of consumer surplus fully, but you just have, in order to, to get a certain project, you get all the increase, but you have to pay something for this project. Okay? Th that's what we have. Yeah. And, and that's a nice thing. So, what we learned here, and remember, risk neutrality is always a good thing somehow if you get some, some information. Here, we really, we really can. Uh, we really can implement the full information outcome, even though we has, have asymmetric information. So we can get, get the right incentive, even though, of course, now uh, the, the, the rents are slightly, excuse me, the, the, the transfer are slightly different than in a full information outcome. There we assume that UL is equal to UH, but the point is here it's only the expected utility which matters. Uh, we have then, therefore, a really high powered incentive scheme. High power just means that we get quite different uh, payment if you re realize if the good state is realized rather than the bad state is realized. Okay, and of course it's a problem in a bad state here. Uh, exposed, you might end up even though you worked hard, you end up in a bad state and you make losses. Okay, that's uh, this firm has be able has to be able to. To, to bear these losses, and that's what we will turn to, uh, I think, in the next but one uh, uh, exp extension of this, where we look into limited liability. Okay, now uh, the second point is the risk aversion, and here uh, assume simply that u is some small some fu function of ur, so what we used in our example was that this sm a small function u is just a square root in a sense, okay? And this is what we had. This would be concave. That's the example I told you. And uh, I already, so this is just the inverse. This would be the square. Uh, and that's what I just showed you uh, uh, on, on our previous slide. Remember, that's what we had here uh, as, an, as an example. And uh, now we have this concave relation. Uh, we get uh, what, what we had here in the full information outcome. That's what I already told you. This is nothing else now or nothing new. That's why I uh, don't uh, need to, to spend more time on this. The important point is that the full, informa uh, the full information uh, solution would, be, would give you very poor incentives because you get the same paid irrespective of your effort. So why should you provide any effort? Okay. And the second best policy and that's what I told you already, is uh, that you give incentives, UL will be higher than UH, and therefore VL of UL, uh, or however VL of UL will also be higher than uh, VH of UH, and that means, uh, here you, you remember on the previous uh, slide, we had that uh, this part was equal, okay? Uh, we had put so high incentives that this part was equal, uh, but uh, here it's, it's less, so uh, we have lower powered incentive than in the previous case. So we provide incentive, but we provide less incentives, of course, than in the case of risk neutrality. And the greater risk, risk reversion is the lower powered are these incentives. If you have infinite risk aversion, so that the utility is the same, if you get uh, uh, 2,000 euro per month or, or 3,000 euro, the, the utility is always determined by your minimum, uh, then you wouldn't give any, any incentives here. Okay, that, that's what we have. But that's exactly what we already, uh, what we, we already uh, derived. I think we don't have an example on that because it's so, so tedious to, to calculate and it's hard to do without any mathematica. But what we have an example and uh, uh, is, is the final case we consider here. This is risk neutrality with limited liability. That's uh, something we already briefly discussed in a, 
in an audit uh, case, uh, of course, what we see here uh, in, in or what we saw in, in the previous case where we implemented the full information outcome, uh, in a sense, we provided a high incentive in a good state, but that means that we have, uh, in a sense, a high loss in a bad state. And high loss in a bad state means that these firms can capture or cover uh, losses in the bad stage. Uh, a bad state. And, and that's not clear that this is possible. So if you have a firm with limited liability, you cannot uh, have a rent exposed, which is negative. Okay. Of course, ex ante, uh, you might have uh, a rent of zero, even though you get uh, 1000 in a good state and minus 1000 in a bad state. But the point is, can you cover these losses of mon minus 1000 when the, when the, when the, bad state turns out and here we just assume that you can't you can't uh, do anything uh, can not get receive a payment uh, or, or receive anything which uh, leaves you with a with a rent which is negative okay so r i has to be uh, non negative in each case and therefore in a, a bad state in a high uh, cost state you assume that rh is equal to zero now if you want to provide incentives you have to pay uh, to pay a rent in the in the in the good state uh, if it turns out to be a low cost uh, firm, okay? And uh, of course, you see uh, this is this being zero, this being positive. The expected value will be positive, and the firm's overall rent here is then phi times uh, R L minus the uh, D phi. We assume here with, this, with these values, and I think that's what's the last bullet here, that this uh, value uh, is so hard, high that the ex ante participation constraint is not binding. So this rent is sufficiently high that phi R L plus one minus phi R R H minus this D phi is, is larger than zero. Okay. Now the firm enjoys a positive rent, and again, of course. Uh, the, the difference, the delta u, this is nothing else than our delta u here, uh, is just RL, the difference in, in, in terms of utility, the power of the incentive scheme. And the regulator now uh, needs to maximize uh, pretty much the same as previously, uh, but now we have to take into account, uh, we have to pay here the rent, and again, now once we pay a rent, our alpha matters. Okay, that's that's here and here. Okay, because we have to weigh that. We typically uh, assumed or very often assumed that alpha is equal to zero, so we don't care for the rent of the firm. Of course, nevertheless, we have to pay it in order to provide an incentive. This would be just here the standard. This is nothing else than our T here. Okay, our transfer, and that's that's our standard uh, uh, our standard uh, setup. Again, we maximize expected total surplus and taking into account that if the good state turns out, we have to pay to pay a rent. Okay, that's what we have, and we determine this rent up here. And uh, yeah, so for this RL, we simply can substitute the d phi, uh, uh, the, the d prime of phi, uh, and and uh, yeah, that, that's that's then. Uh, in a sense, straightforward, because then uh, we get uh, as the objective function, and this I just uh, updated this in new slides. It will be slightly different because you will have the RL still here, but it's easier to see then uh, if we take the derivative with respect to phi, what the first order condition, what the optimal condition is. Okay, and uh, here you see uh, taking the derivative with respect. Uh, to 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 phi, uh, you would get a, a d prime here. Uh, take a derivative. Here's a phi. Okay, that leaves you this here, and then uh, that here you get uh, then also the the second derivative here. So it, it, it's straightforward to to derive that. You see here you have a alpha d prime phi. If you take the derivative with respect to so what you do here is d w phi okay and from that this follows should be clear uh, and and so you get all if you take the derivative you get all this here 
And important point here already, you see that now you're already trained to look for common patterns. Our previous pattern in full information outcome was that D prime is identical to this gain in, in total surplus. Okay, and now you have an additional negative thing here. Uh, D, D, D prime prime, D double prime uh, is positive. We, uh, this, uh, this utility from effort is increasing and convex. Okay, the more uh, this uh, the, the, the more effort you have to put in, or the higher the probability is you want to achieve, the more it costs to get an extra increase in this probability. So you 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 subtract something, and therefore you get with limited liability, as we are here, you get a lower incentive. Limited implied, and, and therefore limited liability implies less effort, and because you get a lower powered incentive. Unless, and that's uh, what we always have, unless you don't care for the rent, if, uh, and if it's clear, if you are happy to provide a rent, uh, and alpha is one, so you get the same. Okay, uh, I think uh, that's, that's almost it, because now we have really derived our result. Okay, and uh, there is actually a case uh, with two stars in, in the problem set. Uh, perhaps you can look into that, where you really see uh, how uh, this changes, how this limited liability problem changes uh, this nice uh, result for, for the risk neutral firm. You will see now, uh, once you have risk neutrality, it's not about insurance and incentives. That was in, in risk aversion, okay? Uh, so if you provide uh, incentives, you have to pay that because then it gets very expensive because the firm has to bear risk if it's risk averse, okay? And that's why you, why you have only limited uh, uh, incentives. And here, however, the point is you provide incentives, but you know if you provide incentives, you have to pay a rent. Okay? This is different from the previous case with risk aversion, because there you always satisfy uh, the participation constraint and you don't pay a rent. But here you have to pay a rent and you want to limit the rent, and that's why you provide a limited incentive. Okay. I think uh, that's about it uh, for this. Uh, moral hazard uh, part and uh, here uh, this is the last uh, last slide of these chapters on on asymmetric information on adverse selection and on moral hazard and what we saw is first of all uh, that's a pretty standard assumption which I already tried to motivate in our very first lecture where I sh showed you these Australian uh, uh, case with uh, the different information or different cost estimates of the regulator and the regulated firms. And the point here is what we learned, if you have private information, if you have superior information about your cost, about marginal cost, fixed cost, remember all these, Baron Myers and Louis Sepping and Lafayette Roll, uh, and so on, if you have this uh, cost advantage, you can command the rent of it because you if you are the low-cost firm, for instance, uh, you can just always claim to be of the other type and therefore would always get a rate. So, and the point is here, uh, I think i probably uh, go uh, to the next two uh, bullets here. Of course, you get this rent. Uh, what you want as a regulator, and that's what I showed you with the regulation principle, and that's what's always optimal, is that it's good if you design a contract in a way that uh, you induce truth telling, okay? And therefore, because uh, therefore you 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 can realize Pareto gains, you can realize a higher welfare, okay? But at the same time, you want to limit this rent, and that's actually uh, what we do in the next. Uh, uh, bullet here, you induce outcomes that somehow distort the decision. They differ from the outcome we would have uh, under full information, and that's in particular in terms of, uh, remember, Bear Myers and the price of the high type is distorted upwards, is distorted away from the, the, the marginal cost. Okay, And these distortions, as previously here in the last case, serve to limit the firm's rent. And finally, we had some discussion of, of, say, for instance, of capture and of, of, of uh, 
dynamics and commitment. Of course, the important point is that we need to have a benevolent regulator, and a benevolent regulator is better able to limit the firm's rent uh, if uh, he or she is endowed with a broader set of regulatory instruments and more extensive commitment powers. Regulatory instruments, we saw that was in the very beginning, of course, that you don't get a very good result if you or a worse result if you cannot pay any transfers, okay? That was the first part. If you can't pay any transfers, you always have to observe the uh, non-negativity constraints so you run into troubles. And of course, commitment we also discussed, so I don't want to spend uh, much more time here. And this was the very final point. Uh, if you have limited commitment power, you might even choose a pull in equilibrium. Okay, I think I'm done with this part. Uh, I'm just making a short uh, break here and move then on uh, to, to chapter 11. Yeah, okay, so of course this was a very tough uh, topic or were very tough topics, this, this uh, regulation under adverse selection and under moral hazard and uh, fully it will only become clear once you discuss all the different, the different problems in the site tutorial class from the assignment and therefore I hope that it becomes clear there and of course we also can uh, take many of the questions you might have also in, in the tutorial class. Now I move on to something which hopefully uh, is, is, is uh, less abstract in a sense and, and uh, in a sense is also formally uh, easier to tackle. Uh, we went or we move on to information and multiple firms to what is called yardstick competition and monopoly franchises. The problem is always how can uh, or the starting point is always how can the problem of asymmetric uh, information be mitigated in a situation in which it's clear that we have a monopoly in the market. We will only have a single firm in the market. So uh, as, as uh, I think Demsets called it, uh, it's not possible that we have competition in the market, but if we do not have competition in the market, we have, might have, first of all, competition for the market, which is actually the first part. We have multiple cons, uh, contestants for a monopoly franchise. Uh, that's what we see, for instance, in railways, where we have uh, now always a single firm being active or, or uh, providing a certain connection. South Western Railways in, in, in UK provides some connection uh, in, in the vicinity of London, whereas here HLB, uh, Hessische Landesbahn, provides a certain connection from, say, Frankfurt to Gießen, and there is just an auction uh, where they have to to apply uh, or to submit a tender a, a bit in order to win this Tender. We might, however, also ha uh, mitigate our asymmetric problems if we have multiple uh, monopolists, but multiple independent monopolists. And that's the first part I, I turn to then. Uh, what you will see is that there are at least two benefits of multi-firm supply. The first is what uh, I think uh, Armstrong Sapping call a sampling benefit. That is, you have a greater chance of finding a low-cost firm, of course, that works only if you have multiple con contestants. So it's more likely uh, if you have 10 firms uh, applying for a certain uh, regional uh, public transport system, uh, if you have several applicants or several bidders, the, your chance that you get a low-cost firm is higher than if you have only a single one. Okay, That would be the sampling benefit. The second benefit which uh, matters in both uh, situations is the so-called rent reducing benefit because now uh, the private information is reduced and therefore uh, you can reduce the rent. And the point is, that's what already what I told you, these benefits can even be seen in the market if competition in the market is not possible but competition for the market. Okay, Th That's an important for the market. That's an important point. Uh, even though competition for the market actually, uh, in a strong sense, only applies in this case. Okay. Yeah. First of all, I want to turn to the uh, to this part here: multiple independent monopolists. And uh, the German electricity system is a really good e example of that. In particular, if you look into the electricity distribution system uh, operators. So we have. 
These are all so-called Stadtwerke, so muni municipal electricity companies, uh, largely. And here you see the efficiency estimates for 179 different German electricity distributors. I think here is even Mittelhessen Nets, which would be some, I think is even a, a, a subsidiary of, of Stadtwerke Gießen. Okay, and what you have here is, of course, if you have only a single monopost, this and, and you cannot directly observe its cost, uh, it's hard. You don't know is it high or low. But now you have this 179 and uh, you might be able to, to compare them. Okay, uh, you will see how you can uh, uh, implement something so that they reveal their information. Actually, what, what the Bundesnetzagentur, the Federal Network Agency does, they compare these different companies and uh, even though they did not implement some benchmark or yardstick, uh, yardstick uh, regulation, uh, what they do is they uh, look into their costs and tell them, this guy here, okay, you better increase uh, your efficiency because otherwise you will have uh, you will not be able to cover your costs because the, the 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 network charge we allow you will not be not cover your costs because it's uh, it's uh, based on uh, efficient uh, costs. Okay, uh, actually in Germany, and that's what you can read in the note. We have I think more than than 800 of these. Uh, German electricity uh, distribution system operators, but uh, as you see, more than 600 are small, probably smaller than I think uh, something than 30,000 households or something than that, and they uh, for them uh, uh, simplified regulatory system applies, so they don't have any efficiency estimates. Actually, there is some some standardized. Uh, some some lump sum or some some average uh, estimate for that. Okay, so the point is here. Now we have these 179 different German electricity distribution system operators, and N.J. Schleifer came up with a very nice model uh, where he showed how we can uh, or how a mechanism can look like so that we can uh, produce competition among these independent monopolists. Okay, that's what we actually do. And so that we can even achieve the first best solution. So what we assumed here is, or what, what Schleifer assumes is that we have an identical local monopolist. Of course, in terms of our German, uh, German uh, distribution, DSOs, distribution system operators, they are hom uh, heterogeneous, but for the, for the minute and for the sake of illustration, assume that they are identical and they've each face the same demand and they each have uh, chances to reduce their costs by making investments. Okay, And uh, if they don't make any investment, they are stick with some high cost level. Uh, the, the point is that we assume that regulator doesn't know anything about uh, their cost. Uh, the regulator doesn't know demand and doesn't know these, these investment function, but it can observe the realized cost and the realized fixed cost and the realized uh, 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 marginal uh, cost and uh, however can only observe that afterwards and doesn't know these investment function okay uh, doesn't know whether there would have been possibility to have even lower cost in a sense here uh, it could only observe oops I was too quick again it could only observe this point here Okay, ex post, but didn't know uh, whether uh, this is really the efficient cost or not. Okay, but that's what uh, what uh, the regulator can observe. Okay, so what are we doing then? Uh, a further important assumption is that the firm's managers maximize profits, uh, but as long as profits are not at stake, they exert as little as effort as possible. What does that mean? Now, it means that if the regulator sets price equal to this observed marginal cost and transfer equal to the fixed cost, uh, what is your profit? Your profit would be zero. Uh, and if you uh, work harder uh, and you get a lower uh, uh, co marginal cost here, again, and higher fixed cost, again, your profit would be zero. So why should you work hard and, and think about these investment projects? So you always have the same 
same profit, so you don't exert any effort with a, a, if, if price is set uh, uh, if price is just set equal to to marginal cost and the transfer equal to fixed cost, so you don't invest. Okay, uh, that's what I, I gave you in the notes uh, the the respective uh, explanation by Schleifer, but the, I think the, the the basic point should have become clear. So the firms would not invest in cost reducing activities. And that's uh, similar to what we had in terms of our cost of service regulation. So if you just get your cost recovered, why should you work hard to reduce uh, uh, to reduce your cost? Okay. Now the, the the very nice idea by by Schleifer is that you can even attain the full information outcome uh, with the following policy. And the point here is, you are Stadtwerke Gießen PI. And your price is set according not to your own cost, but to the observed cost of all others. And your transfer is set according to the fixed cost of all others. And now, of course, your profit uh, is at stake. Because if others, uh, first of all, price equals marginal cost, uh, yeah, that, that will be the result. But the, the point is, how does that mechanism work? Now, yeah, if all others don't do anything, if they all others uh, uh, have a C uh, of zero, you can increase your profit by investing because then you will have uh, the price just equal to being C zero, but your cost will be lower, even though your fixed cost will be higher under some regulatory uh, reg uh, regu regularity assumptions on 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 F, and that's what you will see in one of our assignments. Uh, you just get uh, an incentive to invest. Okay, you now really compete against these other 178 companies. Actually, the Bundesnetzag into the Federal Network Agency, uh, when they first presented their concept for incentive regulation, they said, uh, you, "You remember that we have these five-year incentive regulation periods, and they had plans for the first period and the second period, and they." Uh, had the plan in the third period to implement this kind of yardstick or benchmark regulation. Okay, and the point is, you really come up with a very nice result here in equilibrium, uh, the full information result, because in a sense you produce a prisoner's dilemma among these firms. They all have to invest, and they will invest so much that price equals marginal cost and productive efficiency is achieved, and so you got, don't get a profit. The problem here is. Uh, why are you forced to do that now? If the others invest, uh, you would make losses. Okay, and managers don't like losses because they might get fired. Okay, and here you have a high-powered incentive. The firm has uh, no effect, uh, effect on its price and the transfer it's get, but you, the firm is a residual claimant of its profits. Okay, and these profits, uh, if you work less hard than the others, it's negative. Okay, you get fired. Uh, and that was this basic assumption by, by, by uh, Schleifer. So you care, uh, uh, man firms, managers maximize profits uh, if, if that means uh, uh, it changes anything. Okay. Uh, if you get zero profits anyway, you don't do anything, but here you might run into trouble. You can uh, make even losses or you can make profits. Okay, so uh, hopefully this this is clear uh, right now. Uh, you got s some idea. Actually, it's rather straightforward to calculate, even though the calculation of the Nash equilibrium is a bit harder. But what we do uh, in 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 our assignment, and that's what uh, should become clear. I just jump here to my assignment. Uh, we have a very nice. A result here you see a country with 100 regions uh, where you have different periods and in the first period the regulator sets the price according to uh, the, the cost of the previous period and then you just uh, look or, or calculate what the optimal what the optimal uh, uh, investment of these firms is that that's what you can uh, do and uh, you will see that it's rather straightforward to calculate that okay yeah so and that's a nice thing by doing this you really can implement first best uh, and 
here you have of course not the sample uh, the sampling benefit uh, of of uh, competition because still you have Stadtwerke Gießen as a monopolist here but you exploit the rent reducing benefit because if these firms are all identical they have the same uh, opportunities for cost uh, reduction uh, you can introduce competition among them and therefore uh, really here in this case drastically reduce the rent. And the problem, of course, is if you are then Stadtwerke Gießen and you are compared with the Enwag in Wetzlar, the Stadtwerke Wetzlar, the municipal electricity and, and, and uh, gas company there, you would say, oh, Wetzlar is very different. Actually, Wetzlar would say that oh, we have such a hilly, hilly city, so much uh, rocks and so on, and it's very hard, for instance, uh, to, to dig the... the uh, or, or to put the, the, the water pipes in the ground and so on, okay? Uh, so you have the need for symmetry and that's somehow also the problem for, for uh, the regulator. Actually, in terms of, of uh, regulation of water prices, in Germany we don't have an ex-ante regulation of water prices, but we have an antitrust overview, so to say, by the Bundeskartell, the federal uh, cartel office. And what they actually did is they, uh, they uh, enacted a few proceedings or they started a few cases against uh, German water companies uh, and uh, accused them of abusing the dominant position and charging too high prices. Actually, a famous example here was, was the Einbach in Wetzlar, the Wetzlar Water Company. Okay, and uh, what they did is they compared the water price in Wetzlar with the water price in, in, other, uh, in other municipalities. Okay, of course, it's always a problem. Uh, is that really a good comparison? Uh, and uh, there is no uncertainty in this model, but I don't want to discuss that here any longer because if you have some uncertainty, you might also run, always run into trouble with these limited uh, liability problems. But here, the, the, the argument should have been, been clear. There is another version of this Yahtzee competition problem. That's a so-called reporting version. And here the point is that uh, you ask your monopolist what the costs are and the costs are correlated. Suppose we have Marburg and, and Gießen, the water companies, or actually uh, the previous example was Wetzlar and Gießen. And if we assume here that if Gießen has low costs, it's uh, the probability that Marburg uh, is, has high, uh, has Wetzlar has low cost as well is phi L and the probability that Wetzlar has uh, or if, 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 if Gießen has high cost, the probability that Wessler uh, uh, has low cost is lower. Okay. And that will immediately remember you of our, of our audit analysis. Okay. In, uh, exactly the same, the same argument. The point is here just here you have two different municipalities or 179 municipalities and you ask them what their costs are and their costs are correlated. Of course, uh, so the signal is informative. It's more likely that firm B reports being low cost if firm A is low cost, if it uh, reports truthfully. So we have a correlated signal of A's cost. We get some idea. Now, the point is, uh, yeah, and uh, how can we get firm A to report truthfully given firm B reports truthfully? And now this is just standard. You have just some transfer payment exactly the way we did it in the, in the, in the uh, audit analysis. So uh, if, if B reports to be of low cost and, and uh, A reports to be of high cost, uh, then you get a certain transfer, which actually would be the punishment. And in the other case, you get the other transfer. And as you saw, if you have limited ability to punish the firm, you can implement first best. The full information outcome is an equivalent. Uh, and you get again the rent reducing benefit of competition. Okay. Uh, the, the problem here, however, is uh, the, the guys from Wetzlar and from Gießen are not stupid. They will just meet and say, oh, it's a bad idea uh, if you if you uh, if you report uh, high uh, low cost because uh, then uh, I will also have uh, to report my low cost and we both don't get any rent okay and there is therefore the danger of collusion both firms always reporting high costs 
uh, how can you deal with that problem? Actually, what you would could do is to write better contracts. You might write a contract that you get a bonus as a firm if you're the only one to report low cost. And that would could de destroy these collusive equilibria. Okay. Uh, again, so how well it works is always unclear, but of course you could also, you could say you get really a high millions of bonus if you do that. And of course in equilibrium, as them both have an incentive uh, to report these, uh, these, these, these costs, uh, you will end up, uh, if they really have, okay, you will end up uh, with uh, not making a, making a payment. Okay. So, and of course, same problems apply as with the audit analysis. Uh, if you, 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 it requires risk neutrality and it requires that you are not in a scenario uh, of limited liability. That is, you are able to bear the large penalties. So we have two very nice uh, situations in which we don't have competition in the market, but we have multiple independent monopolies and still implement in a sense the first best we learn from the different monopolists okay now we move on to the second point here uh, to the to the second part namely auctioning monopoly franchises now we get to monopoly uh, excuse me competition for the market and this is something which gained a lot of prominence in the last say 20 or 30 years here you see an example from from Munich, uh, whatever S-Bahn München is, a uh, local public transport, uh, and there was a, a tender uh, uh, for for this pro So Vergabe means just a tender. They they invited bids for the S-Bahn, and of course Deutsche Bahn will do that, and some some other uh, companies. What you have here currently, I think here you see the timeline. I don't know whether they are already finished. Uh, but you see, this is quite a lengthy uh, uh, planning period. It's currently, there is a construction going on, there is installation, and then finally there is the operation. Uh, this would be a, a further would be a further line, uh, a further tr uh, train connection here. And you see, it only starts. The contracts will only start in the 2030s, if you can if you can uh, read that at all. Okay. Does it work? Yes. Here it only starts in the 2030s. Okay. And it's uh, rather lengthy planning periods. And uh, what you also have is, is uh, that you, of course, need rolling stock, etc. And uh, what is interesting here, how do the contracts look like? And what you see here currently, there are so-called, I think I already explained that to you, net contracts. And for later on, it will be gross contracts with incentives. Gross contract just means that the, the firm uh, doesn't get any ticket revenue, passenger ticket revenue, uh, but uh, they just get uh, their, their costs reimbursed, the costs they, they just, in a sense, a bit or submit as their bit with a, with a, with a uh, net contract. Uh, the, you only paid the difference. Uh, you, you, you actually say uh, part of the cost because the, the company, the railway uh, company, obtains the ticket revenues. Okay. I don't want to go into details, but if you uh, if you happen to to uh, run across something like netto vertrag and brutto vertrag, you should have an idea what this what this means. Uh, this is also can be seen uh, in, in the UK where this is now done for many more years and you see they also have rather long planning periods. I also try to uh, increase that here. You see uh, it sometimes stops and, and then uh, you have uh, HS means here you award the contract, uh, here you issue the, the, the franchise uh, you invite you invite uh, for tender bits and so on, and then uh, this this starts and and at some times it it ends. And what you see here, uh, these these uh, so-called franchises, uh, they they are valid for 10, 15, and 20 years. Okay, 
and see, uh, so I probably should go back here. Here you see just East Angla, here you see just which routes we have here, Southwestern, etc., Essex, Thameside. Uh, so here you see all these, uh, these uh, different connections and different franchises. And what they have is they just uh, invite uh, for tenders here. And of course, you can, even though a monopolist uh, runs then this service, uh, or provides this, operates this service, uh, and uh, still we have ex ante competition. Okay, that's what we have, and that's what we are going to look into formally how you should structure that. And here again, assume we have a bare Myerson framework because that's always the easiest. But now the point is that now there are uh, n firms. And each of these firms might have either low cost with a certain probability phi or high cost. And you assume that costs are independent, not correlated as in a previous case uh, with these uh, yardstick competition, but here so you don't have any yardstick possibilities. And the regulator wishes to choose one firm to supply the market. And the policy takes a form that should be clear. If one firm announces it, it has low cost, the franchise is awarded to that firm, or if it's two firms, uh, each firm gets a 50% chance. You just throw a dice, okay, uh, or, or a coin. Uh, and uh, if all firms announce they have high cost, again, you award the contract uh, to any firm at random. Again, you roll a dice or something like that. And uh, in the event that a type I is the winner, Okay, if that firm tells you it's low cost, you will set the price even to uh, PI and uh, transfer even to e equal to uh, TI. And uh, that, that's what we now have to calculate, what the optimal price will be. Okay, you will see we'll also have, like in Bear Myerson always, uh, if you have CL, low cost, you will have PL, but you receive a rent uh, and you will have uh, some distortion if you have a high price. Now, uh, I, I don't want to go through the detail or to, to through these calculations in too much detail, just to give you the idea. So assume that the other firms announce their cost truthfully, uh, and you uh, are of a low type. Otherwise, you don't have to think about claiming to be a low type or uh, cheating if you are a high type. And if you uh, if you claim to be a high type, okay. That's how you, you, you would earn then a rent. The problem is that you only earn uh, or you only win with a certain probability. Okay. In the other case, if you claim to be a high type, you are, you are the high type and you get the franchise. But here, all others have to be of a high type as well. And uh, this is just one minus phi, the probability that you're a high type, that everyone in this independent setup uh, is a high type, so it's just raised to the power of n minus 1. And uh, as it's uh, awarded by random, it's just the uh, 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 y by n. And uh, if you're a low type, uh, you also have a chance that others, uh, uh, if you announce that you're low type, that others gain this, and uh, this is actually this, uh, uh, this uh, expression. Uh, and uh, what you also can show is that this risk uh, expression is larger than rho h, okay? And uh, so uh, I don't want to go to detail because here from this lemma uh, from, from Armstrong's uh, review of economic studies paper, you see that it's not so trivial. So it would, uh, and I don't expect you to calculate it. I just want to show you the, the idea here. What is clear, this is the rent. And the important point is here, uh, that you get this rho L is, is greater than rho H here. The point is, of course, it's clearer that you win. Uh, you get this R L times rho L. This is, in a sense, the expected uh, uh, rent you get if you tell the truth. And here uh, is the expected rent if you claim to be a high type. And you saw previously this is our standard, I always speak in terms of rectangles, this is our standard rectangle, our h would be zero, and now our uh, raw h is of course smaller, actually that, that's an important uh, point, uh, it will be, uh, and that's what we will see in, in the next, I think it will be smaller than, than phi somewhere. Okay, so the point is that you get a lower, it's, it's easier the incentive 
but the incentive compatibility constraint is relaxed here. Okay, uh, because you get the phi, you see here you get the phi and what we can show and uh, I, I didn't do that here, but this thing uh, oh, no, the important point here is with RL this uh, expression was just one, okay? You just got this for sure, if you're low type you got this for sure, but this as rho h is smaller than rho l, this uh, expression is smaller than one. And that means you now don't get, the, if you are a low type, you don't get that uh, rent for sure, but uh, only with a chance which is lower than one, therefore uh, you have a ex lower expected rent and therefore your incentive constraint is relaxed compared to the single cost case. You have to pay a lower rent and we have a rent reducing benefit of competition. Okay, and now uh, what what I, I did here, and uh, what I did here, uh, or actually Armstrong did here, just uh, calculate the welfare, and this is really our standard welfare uh, 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 function in a bear Myers model. The only difference now is here. Okay, R H will be zero anyway, so we can set that equal to zero, and this should. Uh, probably uh, right as an alpha here, uh, but the point is now we have different probabilities here. Now this is the probability of ha having at least one low type firm and uh, of course this probability is simply uh, what we have here 1 minus 5 raised to the power of n is simply the probability that all firms are high type, so 1 minus this is the probability that we have at least one firm. And the point is that this is now higher than phi, that's what also can be shown. Uh, and, and again here, this is of course smaller than 1 minus phi, because 1 minus phi is smaller than 1, and if you raise it to some power of an integer, it will be smaller. So now what you get is a higher chance, and this is the next, next benefit of having multiple potential suppliers, you get a higher chance that you get a low cost firm. And this would be a, a, the sampling benefit. Okay? Uh, and uh, of course, that's what we always have in the standard results. And uh, we, you can look at, I, I just jump uh, over that rather briefly. We won't do it in detail uh, because these, uh, the derivation of these rows are is, is quite complicated anyway. But what you see here and what is the important result here, you maximize something which is completely analogous uh, to our standard bear myers case. And actually the, the strange thing is, even though it, uh, it looks different, you get the same result. You get exactly the same result as in bear myers if you compare that to the previous part. And, uh, so the point is, why do we get that here? We have to pay, uh, we have to pay lower rent. Why don't we, uh, why don't we reduce the price of the high type? The problem is, we have to pay lower rent, but it's a higher probability with that we pay this lower rent because now we have a much higher chance to get a low type, and this is exactly set up. Of, and this is not uh, some specific assumption, but a rather general uh, property uh, called separation property by Lafortiero. Okay, so uh, I think uh, I will try to explain it. And, and uh, there are two two uh, slides left, and I would like to uh, to present them today so that I can I can uh, uh, I can. Uh, conclude this, this chapter. So I would uh, like to take another, uh, say, hopefully five minutes uh, in, in, this, in this discussion. Okay, so here uh, the, the point is, uh, of course, in this story with this franchise allocation, we get some problems once we get to real-world applications where we have franchises, as you just previously saw, for 15 and 20 years. Okay, how long should it be and how often should it be renewed? Uh, the problem is in these franchises you need a lot of investment in rolling stock, which is a durable asset. You have uh, to, 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 to buy new trains and so on, new engines, etc. And this 
uh, it requires in a sense that you uh, can have a long planning period okay uh, and of course it's then very hard to specify all these prices and services into the future and the point is that typically the incumbent has some 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 uh, like Deutsche Bahn uh, did uh, run all these services and they have uh, an advantage in terms of that they know the real cost for instance or they have a much better idea about what ticket revenues will be and so on uh, so uh, the problem is you might to want i don't know do you want to bias it in really in act uh, in favor of the incumbent so that it makes more investment but then you never get an entrant on the other side here uh, the the entrant uh, suffers may suffer of the so-called winner's curse effect because if the entrant wins uh, perhaps this is due to the fact that it uh, made wrong or had wrong expectations about for instance ticket revenue actually there's an interesting example in germany the nord ostsee bahn which which obviously underestimated the cost of the connection you know, between north and uh, north sea and, and baltic sea north sea and baltic sea somehow they they won uh, some franchise but it turned out that they went bankrupt within two years or so. Okay, so it's uh, in, 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 even though it's a, an amazing uh, instrument in order to introduce uh, competition for the market here. Uh, in, in, in in practice, it's a problem, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't have something like that. Problem in Germany is currently in a sense that uh, very often you hardly get uh, two bidders. Okay, for large. Uh, franchises in terms of railways, for instance, S-Bahn Berlin or something like that. Okay, uh, the final point here is uh, the rent reducing effects of joint production. I can make that very brief. Uh, uh, nevertheless, it's very amazing because the point, the question is here, if you have uh, railway uh, franchises, for instance, the connection between Frankfurt and seeing the connection between Frankfurt and I don't know Darmstadt or Mannheim, connection between Gießen and Gelnhausen, and so on. Uh, there are many of these connections, so many different tasks, and each task might be indifferent because the 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 the, the costs between Gießen and Gelnhausen uh, or Hanau. Uh, are completely independent from the cost between Gießen and Siegen, probably, and uh, independent from the cost to the to connection to the Odenwald. Okay, and the point is, how should you regulate that, and how should you assign contracts? Should you assign them uh, to many different suppliers, or should you all assign them to the same company? And here actually is you have something like a portfolio diversification argument here. Here you have an argument f uh, where you see that there are informational economies of scope. If you have many products, okay, and you have many different products, if we, each with unknown margin and costs, and costs are independently uh, distributed, so no yardstick possibilities, then what you should do is just award all uh, the different uh, tasks to a single firm. Why should you do that? Now, if it's really many, you have the law of large numbers. You know with 50% chance with these 100 different uh, franchises, uh, with 50% uh, chance each of these franchises is of high cost and low cost. So if you have only one franchise for each firm, uh, you have a very, uh, very large problem because uh, it's a large uncertainty. But if you have hundred of them, you know that on average fifty of them uh, will be will be will be high cost, and fifty of them will be low cost. So you reach uh, almost perfect outcome if you set a price uh, and, uh, and 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 the transfer uh, equal. So the firm sets a price PI and it receives a transfer equal to the consumer surplus. So that is, it simply uh, uh, maximizes maximizes total surplus. Okay, and what you're doing here is that uh, total surplus for this aggregate, if you have really hundred or more tasks, it doesn't vary very much. Okay, that's what I just told you with this fifty percent. You know that fifty percent will be high price, fifty or high cost. Fifty percent will be low cost. Okay, 
uh, and so you have a clear picture of that. And what you're doing then, you get all these transfer and then of course at the same time you get a tax which is almost equal to the expected value of this uh, expected profit here. And you just leave an epsilon so that it's clear that it can break even. And what you have is that the firm is left with almost no rent. Okay? And of course, clearly this is superior to a policy when different firms supply uh, the different products because in each case then uh, you have to make sure that the participation constraint of the low type is, uh, of the high type, high cost type is guaranteed and that the low type might get a rent. Okay, so the interesting thing is, should we have many different railway companies with these things here? Yeah, actually that uh, claims for more, or that you should not have in the Rhein-Main Verkehrsverbund 25 different companies, but uh, you should have large lots in a sense. So if you have, if you want to assign it to several, uh, several companies, make sure that they are sufficiently large, that they have this portfolio effect. Okay. I think uh, that's about it on this chapter of information and multiple firms. Again, we will have some some assignments on that, so that's uh, why I went through it uh, in a sense rather quickly. But uh, here it's really uh, to get the ideas right. So you saw we just applied the standard kind of analysis we already did previously. Uh, we had this uh, Bear Myers model, and uh, the the what you really should uh, have as a takeaway is that uh, with these auctioning, with these franchises, the point is that you get this uh, 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 rent reducing benefit and sampling benefit. And the interesting thing is that at the same time, uh, these these uh, competition for the market with multiple contestants increases the probability of having a high type. That leads to the uh, uh, point that you have to pay a higher rent, okay? And at the same time, uh, it reduces the rent. So, and these two effects balance, hopefully, yeah, should be somehow clear, hopefully. And I think these are just wonderful, full uh, extensions of this part. And you'll see how really competition can work even if we don't have several firms being active in the market. Yeah, that's that's about it. So, and, and uh, I tried to also show to you that these are empirically relevant uh, policies in a sense. And we will t turn to even more empirically relevant policies, of course, in this part on practical policies, where we will delve much in more detail into what is called uh, tariff basket or price cap regulation. Okay. I'm done. Uh, again, I have to apologize for taking more time uh, from you. Hopefully uh, it was okay. We are still running a little bit behind, uh, or not really behind schedule, but uh, uh, there's one, one week missing in this semester, so uh, you had to accept uh, 10 additional minutes. Hopefully it's okay. Again, I'm available for, for questions in WebEx. I thank you for uh, being with me and uh, see you next week. Bye.